Um, so what happens when you don't get your Christmas bonus? What happens when things don't go your way? What happens when life takes a turn you didn't expect? Or you expected to be at a different place or whatever it is? Um, yesterday, uh, Grace came up from our basement and she said, the, the ceiling is leaking, and that's something no one wants to hear about their house. So we went downstairs, and sure enough, I had a little bit of some water coming through the ceiling, and I had to call some, some guys over, and they took apart my sheetrock and fixed some leaks and pipes and all that stuff. It, it wasn't planned out, but uh, I, you know, stuff happens in life that is not expected. Um, this, uh, this, for three weeks, our title for the series is I Hate the holidays that came out, that was uh, courtesy of our creative team uh, coming up with that name I hate the holidays and sometimes holidays can be a challenge sometimes seeing certain family or friends during the holidays as a challenge sometimes being alone is a challenge uh, sometimes feeling like you've got to spend money that you don't have is a challenge, or whatever it is, the increased traffic on I-25, or whatever it is. But while we're talking about this, let me talk to you about Christmas Eve services. It's coming up. We have six Christmas Eve services for you to to choose from. All six are going to be identical. They're going to be lit. It's so good. The theme of the the services are broken ornaments. Have you ever broken an ornament? So what we're looking at is, is how God um, works and uses and heals broken people. And we're going to be looking at broken people throughout scripture all the way up to Jesus. So it's going to be a great, great sermon. If you know anyone who needs hope, who needs love, uh, bring them to church. In fact, Christmas Eve services are our biggest evangelistic event in the whole year. I used to church word evangelistic. Uh, It's our biggest weekend where, in this case, it is a weekend. It's our biggest weekend when people who normally don't go to church We'll go to church. So please invite someone to church. Um, tell them, hey, come to church. It's going to be great. We have a lot of people involved in this, and we're going to just you know, pull out all the stops, and we're going to go for it. So it's going to be a great, great time, a lot of fun. And let me just say one more thing. There's a QR code in front of you. Do you see it in front of your chair? Um, that QR code wants you to get out your phone and scan it, and it will take you to a form um, for children, or not children, excuse me, Christmas uh, volunteer needs. So we need volunteers for Christmas Eve services. So do me a favor and just ask the person right next to you, can I borrow your phone? Let's ask them you're going to have and and use their phone, take a picture of it, and we just need help across the board in Christmas Eve services. We're asking everyone to attend one service and volunteer another service and invite someone to come with you, put it on social media, whatever, text them, do something. It's going to be a great, great time. Do that. So today's title is uh, Christmas vacation has been canceled. So we showed that, that, that clip that you just saw with Clark Griswold. He's upset because he you know, didn't get his expected bonus. Uh, sometimes things happen, and we're going to talk about, uh, you know, he wasn't happy. I want to give you 12 signs you're not happy because we're going to look at Philippians chapter 4 about happiness and contentment, and this is a good way to start this message. Um, here's 12 signs. You're not happy, okay? I did some research, and I I Googled, and I read a lot of stuff. These are legit signs of someone who's not happy. Um, one, One is this. You complain about everything or everyone. Now, don't sit by the person and say, that's you. Don't do that. (laughs) You know who you are. You complain. Um, You're a negative person. You're just naturally A negative person. I mean, that's just where you're at. The Broncos are going to lose, and they're never going to be good again, or whatever. Um, You are mean to your server. The server comes around, and there's a part of you that just enjoys being mean to people. You think being truly happy is unrealistic, just not realistic at all. You think the worst will happen. You think the worst about a lot of things. You constantly compare your life to others. You look at their life on Instagram or whatever it is and Snapchat or whatever, and you're like, gosh, they have a better life than me. Um, You give short answers. I thought that one was interesting. 
You give short answers. You numb yourself with addictive habits. Social media, alcohol, drugs, television, busyness, whatever. You numb yourself with addictive habits. Check this one out. You let yourself go. You don't care about maintaining yourself anymore. You just don't care about your habits. You just let yourself go. Um, or you feel like you're a victim of your circumstances. You're the victim. And everything about you and has happened in your life is because other people have wronged you. Or the last one is this. You feel like it's other people's responsibility to make you happy. And when you're not happy, you blame others. And it's their responsibility to make you happy. You may even tell them occasionally, I'm not happy. You know, as some sort of sign, like, like you know what, it's your, it's your job to do this. The thing about this phrase, happy, it's this emotional state that we, we seek and we use to define our contentment at times. Uh, you might say something like, um, you know, do, do you enjoy your job? Well, I'm happy at work right now, right? Or I, I'm, I'm happy in this relationship right now, or I, I'm happy at church right now, or I'm happy with that meeting right now. And you use that phrase, but here's the other side to this phrase. But don't make me unhappy. I can flip. Don't make me unhappy. I'm happy right now, but I can be unhappy. And oh, just wait and see what happens. If I'm unhappy, I won't be happy to be around, that kind of thing. Um, here's the problem. Our emotional state can change day to day. Malcolm Gladwell said this, people don't know what they want. We cannot always explain what we want deep down. And every man said amen to that. We cannot always know what we want. We cannot always know what she wants or he wants. We cannot always know what we want deep in, down inside. I mean, what will make you happy? That's a big question. And, and sometimes we think, well, what will make me happy if my desires are met? Really? What happens if your desires are not wholesome? What happens if your desires are not godly? What happens if you're in a selfish place? What happens if you're prideful? What happens if you're not right with God? Or what happens if you're just not at a good place? Meeting your desires, will that really make you happy? If other people met your, met your needs, was that really going to make you happy? Will it really do that? We think that will happen, but what happens if we're not at a good place? Now, we try to be happy. Hang on with me, guys. We try to be happy. On Amazon, there are over 2,000 titles with advice about how to be happy. Over 2,000 titles. There are 14,000 thoughts about the secret of happiness, and we also try to medicate ourselves. There are over 120 million prescriptions for antidepressants. Yet, depression and anxiety continue to rise. Maybe you look at happiness a little bit like this. You might say, you know what, I'm not happy with my life, or I'm not happy with who I am, or I'm not happy with my husband, or my wife, or my girlfriend, or boyfriend, or my friend. I'm not happy at my job. I'm not happy at my church. I'm not happy, whatever. And you might be at this place and have this tendency to look at other people and say, it's your job, it's your job to make me happy, this kind of thing. But I want to propose something, and I want to give you a Christmas gift. We're going to save you thousands of dollars on counseling today. You should just love this. Here's the gift. The gift of contentment. The gift of contentment. Now, the, the word contentment can be defined as a feeling of quiet happiness and satisfaction. That's what you would look up if you were to Google this and look for a definition. That's what it, but it's this place of, of, of quiet happiness and contentment. It's not hinged to your desires being met. It's not hinged on other people being whatever to you. It's not hinged on favorable circumstances. It's different. Let's jump into the Bible. Philippians chapter 4. Paul the Apostle said, I have learned to be content 
whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Uh, God, we humble ourselves before you. Thank you for your word. I thank you for your unfailing love every morning, your faithfulness every night. Thank you for your presence here, Lord. Thank you for the good souls that came to church. And Lord, they, uh, they got dressed and came to church because they have a desire to meet with you. So I pray by your grace, may your Holy Spirit meet with every soul here, God. Minister to every man and woman, young and old, Lord. And if that's your desire, would you just tell God, God, speak to me. Make that your prayer. Say, God, speak to me. Change my heart. Change my mind. And Lord, by your grace, use me. Fix my thoughts. Help me not to be distracted with anything. God, I want to be lost in your word, and I want your word to live inside of me and burn brightly. And give me the words to say, Lord, and may I speak only the things that you want me to say. Thank you, God, for your presence and your love and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's good to be at church, guys. I love being at church. And um, you guys are putting, you know, God first before the Broncos. So God bless you guys. You're at a good place. You're all going to go to heaven, right? Um, hey, uh, I want to start off by talking. We're going to look at Philippians. We're going to look at these two verses. But I want to start off by talking about this letter to the Philippians. Um, Paul the Apostle is attributed to be the author, and um, he was writing it while he was in prison. He was in jail. And while he was in uh, jail, we have a picture of jail for you, while he was in prison, um, he, uh, he was kind of there under house arrest. Um, when he shows up, it's now been about 30 years since Jesus was ascended into heaven. And it's also written right around the year A.D. 61. And Paul the Apostle is waiting for trial to go before this emperor named Nero, this Roman emperor named Nero. So he's there, and he decides to write a letter to this church that he started about 10 years ago. And his church was in Philippi, and he's writing to these, like, uh, these people who are attending this church. Maybe they're new Christians, or they're seeking Christianity, whatever it is. And he's writing a letter to them. And I had this thought, you know, he's teaching them, incidentally, like, like how to walk with God, how to walk with Jesus, what a Christian life looks like. That's what he's doing. And I had this thought of, like, while he was writing in this jail cell, I wonder how many people were walking walking by him and looking through the bars and thinking, he's writing the New Testament. I don't think anybody thought that. I think they just saw him scribbling on some paper and didn't think much of it. But I think, wow, look how God works. Even in those circumstances, he finds himself in a jail cell and he's writing the very New Testament that becomes the best-selling book of all times. And that's what he's writing inside of there. And something else dawned on me. Isn't it interesting that God is using someone in prison to teach people outside of prison what a life of contentment looks like? Don't you find that fascinating that God is using someone in chains to teach people outside the walls what it means to be free in Christ Jesus? Don't you find that fascinating? God's using someone in prison to teach others about what true joy looks like. I, I think we give our circumstances way too much credit. We think our circumstances drive everything, and a lot of us spend a lot of energy trying to control other people, trying to control our circumstances, trying to control our job, trying to control whatever. But I want you to know it's an inside job. God starts with your heart. When I work with couples, I can't tell you how many times he says it's if she would only do this, or she says, if he would only do this, let me just tell you, it starts with you. 
It starts with your relationship with God. All right, you ready to go into this? Verse 1, here we go. Paul says this, therefore, say therefore with me. Oh, right on. We'll warm up this engine here. We'll get going. My dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. Isn't that a cool, cool way to stay true to the Lord? Stay true. Say, stay true with me. Stay true. Don't, don't, come on now, hang with me. I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. Yeah, could, Paul is saying, you know what, your changed life is my crown. Have you ever thought when you get to heaven, wouldn't it be cool if you met people in heaven that are in heaven because of you? You talk to them about Jesus on this side of heaven. Now, you might be thinking, well, I'm not sure how many of those people will. Well, get on it, brother. Get on it, sister. You don't know how much time you have. If you call yourself a Christian, talk to other people about Jesus. Share your faith with them. Talk to them. Verse 2. Paul says, now, I appeal to Yodia and Sintichi, please, because... You belong to the Lord. Say you belong to the Lord with me. You belong to the Lord. Settle your disagreement. Who's Yodia and Sintichi? These are two women. And we don't know what happened. Scripture doesn't tell us what happened. But apparently, these two Christian women, church-going women, something happened between them, and everyone knows that Yodia and Sintagi are not talking. Good Christian women. I know it's a big surprise. Then Paul says this, and I ask you, my true partner, to help these true Two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. Wow. Maybe they were preachers or missionaries or group leaders or whatever, but they were actually telling other people about Jesus while they weren't getting along with each other. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co workers whose names are written in the what church? In the the book of life. So here you, you read this in, in Philippians chapter 4, this phrase, the book of life. What's the book of life? The book of life, you read about it in the book of Revelation. And it's a book where anyone who receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is written down in this book of life. Glory to God. And now, now Paul refers to the book of life here. But he's, he's talking about these two women. And I want to make sure we drill down just a little bit because this has to do with contentment or the beginning of contentment. Um, Paul says, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. Think about that a little bit. Because you belong to the Lord. Because you belong to the Lord. Another version says it like this. Work in harmony with the Lord. Have you ever heard music that's not in harmony or someone that's out of whatever pitch or whatever? I mean, it just sounds like, oh, that doesn't sound good. But harmony is a beautiful thing. Another version says this. To be of the same mind in the Lord. So Paul is talking to these, these two ladies, and he's saying, because you belong in the Lord, because, you, because that's where you're at, you, you're in harmony with the Lord, to be of the same mind in the Lord, because you are in the Lord, settle your disagreement. Now, here's what Paul is saying. Here's what he's saying. When you're in the Lord, first of all, it's this, it's this place, this spiritual place where you've allowed Jesus Christ to live inside of you. You are impregnated with Jesus. You know his voice, right, out of John chapter 10. You know his voice. He, you abide in him and he abides in you, John chapter 15. There's this spiritual intimacy that you have with Christ. You spend time in his word every single day. You talk to him all the time when you're going to Starbucks or on a walk with a dog or whatever it is. You know Jesus. It's also this place where you have died to yourself. Christianity, the essence of Christianity is death to self. That's the essence of Christianity. So it's this place where you have died to yourself, and it's also this place where you repeatedly say, not my will, but your will be done. You hear that? 
And when you die to yourself, it's also this decision that, hey, you know what? My wants and desires are not top priority. My opinion is not top priority. My preferences is not top priority. It's whatever God wants, and I'm going to trust him. So to be in the Lord is this intimate relationship with Jesus Christ where people look at you and they see the way you love and you just love differently. You forgive. You don't hold grudges. You care about the things of God. You care about his church. You love. You serve. You care about it. You give. That's this intimacy, this place. And what Paul is saying, here's the warning. Paul is saying these two women, they were co-laborers with him spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the warning is this. You could be in church and not be in the Lord. There's the warning. You guys know what that looks like. For a long time, guys, I came to know Jesus at 18. But for much of those years, you know why I didn't go to church? Because I looked at the people who came out of the church. I said, hypocrites. They don't act any different. They don't love different. They don't act different. They party with me during the week. They don't, they're not any different from anyone else. So I thought, why should I go to church? I have other things to do. What a waste of time. Haven't you met someone who calls himself a Christian and, and, and they're not in the Lord? Have you ever met someone who says, yes, I go to church, and you're surprised? You know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, you go to church. Or you hear the words that come out of their mouth and hear how critical they are of others. Maybe even their own pastor. And you think, that doesn't make sense. Then Paul is saying, if you're in the Lord, and they're in the Lord, then settle the disagreement. There's something bigger at stake. There's something bigger at stake. And by the way, God sees everything. So what are you worried about anyway? God sees everything. Here's what I want you to see. The secret of contentment starts with whether or not you are in the Lord. Your relationship with Jesus is everything. It starts with whether or not you are in the Lord. It starts with your, the proximity of Christ living in you, like if it's real. It starts there. I'm so happy. Just a few, couple of weeks ago, whatever, um, a young man, uh, 19 year, 18 years old, and, and he's given his life over to Jesus, and he told me God has a calling on his life, and he has not missed church ever since. And God's working inside of him, and he attends his church. It's a beautiful thing. I'm so happy at the 9 o'clock service, there's this couple that gave their life over to Jesus, and they never used to go to church like they're going to church over here, and now they both want to get baptized together. And, and they're just, they're, they're really old they're like in their 40s you know but uh, but I'm just you know God's at work and it's so cool and I'm so happy that we have a whole bunch of young adults in this church that are learning to walk with God let me say it again if you're single and you're dating look for someone who loves God more than you I'm so happy that God is at work in this church praise the Lord God is moving whole uh, whole I'm gonna get excited I'm gonna start preaching in a little bit the fact that some of you are not happy is evidence that you're not in the Lord. You keep looking at other people and say, you need to make me happy, you need to make me happy, you need to make me happy. It's it's not about them. It's about your relationship with God. That's where it starts. And we get ourselves into trouble when we start expecting other people to make me happy. And we look for their other experiences and we say, okay, I'm just going to hop from this experience to this experience and I'm going to try this and I'm going to try this and I'm going to try this and I'm going to try this. And then you get at the end and you realize you're still not happy. Your soul is still not at a good place. So it starts with your relationship with Jesus. Paul is saying something else. You have a choice. And he's telling these women, you can reconcile if you want to. So what he's saying, you have a choice. All right, let's keep going. Verse four. Paul then says, let's read this uh, first five words out loud, guys. Rejoice in the Lord always. One more time. Rejoice. I will say it again. 
Say it with that exclamation mark. I will say it again. Oh, let's see more way to go. When you are truly content, nobody has to remind you to rejoice in the Lord. When you're truly content, you just trust God. It's pretty simple. Then you keep reading, and here's a, uh, well, actually, verse 5 says this. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Isn't that a cool, I mean, I, I don't know how many times I've heard this compliment. For, my, for me, I'll just be honestly, uh, maybe you've heard it, but what a cool goal. That because you are in Christ, because you are in the Lord, your gentleness is well known. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, would it be cool for people to look at you? Yeah, that, 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 guy, that guy just has such a tender spirit. She has such a sweet spirit about her. Gentleness. The Lord is near. And then I want us to read verse 6. This is a, this is a memory verse. If you want to memorize one in uh, Philippians chapter 4, here's the verse to memorize. Um, let's read it out loud. Do not be anxious about anything. Come on. But in every situation... By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Great word. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. What's this about? So the original Greek language, when it says do not be Do not be, do not be anxious about anything. The words do not be, the force behind that is this. Stop it. Turn to the person next and just tell them, stop it. That's what it means. Stop it. And Paul is saying, you got to follow it. He's saying, stop it. Do not be anxious about anything. Are there any, are there any overthinkers in the house? (laughs) <laughs> you know who you are. You just take trips in your head. You have scenarios play out. You've got dramas going on in your head. Nothing has happened yet, but you're like, God, you got all kinds of theater, theatrical stuff running on in your head. You convince, you're, you overthink. Any people struggle with anxiety. Here, here's what I, want, here's what I want, to, want you to hear. Stop it. Stop it. Do you think God would ask you or ask us to do something that's impossible? No way. God doesn't toy with us. And here scripture is saying, hey, overthinkers, anxious thought, whatever, worriers, (laughs) stop it. Here's what you're supposed to do if you have an anxious thought. Here it is. Um, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, here it is, by, by what church? By By prayer and petition. And then, by the way, with thanksgiving. So here's what you're supposed to do. When you have anxious thoughts and you worry and you overthink, you're to take those anxious thoughts, that worry, and you're to say, God, I'm going to give this to you. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to overthink this. I'm going to give it to you. And then you let go. You got to let go. <laughs> you let go. And you say, God, it's in your hands, and I trust you, and I'm thankful, God, that you are taking care of that, and I'm releasing it into your hands. You got to learn to do that. You don't have to worry about anything. Give it to God. And here's the consequence for that. Verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. I love that phrase, transcends all understanding. Will, Will what church? Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So here's what that means. You worry, you overthink. What if I don't ever get married? What if I don't ever have that job? What if something bad happens to me? What if what happens to me in the future? I don't know. What happens if something happens to my kids? What happens if something happens to me in the future? What happens if I lose my job? What happens if whatever? You give it to God and you say, God, I'm going to release this in your hands. I'm not going to worry about it. And thank you, God, 
for being such a good God in my life, and you release it. And scripture says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard. Say guard with me, guard. That word is a military word. It's like a Navy SEAL or a Green Beret or an Airborne Ranger. And the peace of God will will be this Navy SEAL over your heart and your mind. Do you feel that? So when that happens, your circumstances may not have changed. And you'd be like, well, no, I, I still don't have a job. Or no, I'm still in this situation. Or this hasn't been resolved yet. But I have this peace that it's all good. It's unexplainable. It's a mystery. But that's the spiritual peace that God gives you. Let me say it like this. Contentment is a deep peace that comes from God after you make a conscious choice to surrender your anxious thoughts to him. So contentment is, it's this deep peace that is unexplainable. And you're like, I know, and it's not about you relying on your own willpower. It's not about you relying on some nest egg. It's not about you relying on some finances or some plan that you have. It's about you relying on your God. It's about you living in The Lord. I read this quote to Grace, and I said, Grace, what do you think about this quote from Tim Keller, Dr. Tim Keller? And I I read it to her, and she says, that's a great quote. It really wasn't his quote. It was my quote. I just wanted to see what level I was at. And she said, it was a great quote. Pastor joke there, but that's our pastor. It's our life at home. Verse 8. Finally, say finally with me, finally. Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, or whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what are those next four words there? Think. Now we're talking about your thought life. Paul's talking about your thought life. And he's saying, here's what should fill your head. Your thoughts should be what? True, noble, right, pure, Lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. That's what he says. Then he says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And here it comes again. And the peace of God will be with you. Will be with you. So here's what Paul is saying now. He's talking to this church in Philippi. Here's what he's saying. The thoughts you allow to swirl in your head are not harmless. They have the power to ultimately determine whether you are a happy or a bitter person. This is like the most important real estate in your life. This is where the battle is a lot of times, right guys? There's all kinds of battles going on in here that we don't share with other people. This is it. We have the freedom to control our thoughts. You don't have to allow every single thought to live in your head. You get to pick and choose which thoughts you're going to allow to live here. Another place says, as a man thinketh, so he is. So how you, what you allow to live here is important. This is a mark of spiritual maturity, the ability to master your mind, the ability to master your thoughts, all the way to the point if you're looking at your phone and you're looking at videos and you're like, man, I know this isn't right, and you have the power to get out of that or whatever it is and say, I'm not going to let my mind go there. Or you're listening to a song or whatever it is, and you're just daydreaming or whatever, you're driving in your car or whatever it is, you have the ability to master your mind. But you're not on your own. It's not about your willpower. Remember, this whole thing is about you being in the Lord. Your relationship with Jesus Christ living inside of you, learning to walk by faith, learning to walk with God, learning what it means to live that life of of faith. It it all starts there. And and then God wants you to master your mind. There's this, uh, I came across a quote by Dan Gilbert. He wrote a book called The Surprising Science 
of happiness. There's a TED talk out there on him actually. And he did some research on happiness, but he said this, our longings and our worries are both to some degree overblown because we have within us the capacity to manufacture the very commodity we are constantly chasing. You know what he's saying? He's saying this, we can create our own reality just with our thinking. Think about that a little bit. You can come to conclusions just with your thinking. You can take trips without ever putting it into drive. You know what I'm talking about? You can think about some things about other people, about circumstances, and you can come to conclusions without ever having a conversation with them. You can do that. You can convince yourself the grass is greener on the other side, even though you haven't gone to the other side. I'll be happier if I wasn't married. I'll be happier if I wasn't at this job. I'll be happier if I wasn't here. I'll be happier if whatever. You, the, the mind is so powerful, you can create these other realities within yourself and convince yourself, uh, like, I'll never do that again. I'll never, whatever. If I serve again, I'll never, whatever. And you can go there, and in your mind, it could become concrete. We can create our own reality within our own thoughts. And we don't even have to leave the comfort of our thoughts. Your thinking determines your perspective. Your thinking determines your contentment. I want to share a story with you about a a Jewish man in Hungary who went to a rabbi. Feels like a bar joke right now. A Jewish man in Hungary who went to a rabbi. So this Jewish man in Hungary goes to this rabbi and he says, Rabbi, I need help. We got nine people living in one room. Maybe they were siblings. I don't know. We have nine people living in one room. And, and what do we do? We cannot stand each other. We're on top of each other. It's crowded. It smells. It's horrible. And the, and the wise rabbi said, okay, here's what you do. Get your goat and put your goat in the room. And the Jewish man didn't like the advice, but... He followed the advice of the rabbi. So the goat comes into the room, and, and, the, and the rabbi incidentally said, come back in a week. So the, 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 the goat goes into the room, and they have the goat for one week. And a week later, the Jewish man goes back to the rabbi. And, he, and the rabbi asks, so how's it going? And, and the Jewish man says, it's horrible. This goat is eating everything. This goat is pooping everywhere. This goat smells so bad. He steps all over. Every, this goat is creating chaos in this room. And then the rabbi said, okay, now remove the goat and come back in a week. So he gets the goat out, comes back in a week. And the, and the rabbi said, so how's it going now? And the Jewish man said, it's amazing. There's only nine of us. It's great. The goat is gone, and that place smells so much better, and it's just us. It's amazing. Here's what you need to hear. Contentment is more about your perspective than your circumstances. It's more about your perspective than your circumstances. Turn to the person next and just tell them it could be worse. (laughs) It's not that bad. God's a big God. Somebody's calling. God's calling someone right now. Jesus wants you to hear this message. Uh, it, it's, it could be worse. It could be worse. Don't worry. Verse 10, here he comes. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. First of all, I want, you, I want to draw your attention to two words, have learned. Paul the Apostle is saying, I have learned. Now, what he's saying is he's learned by experience. He's been on high times. He's been on low times. He's seen a lot. He's been a student of circumstances. He's watched injustice. He's watched God work. He's watched the way God schemes and works everything out. And he's saying, I have learned. And let me say this. 
You have to learn to be content. It has to be a prayer. If you've never said this prayer, you haven't learned contentment, truly. You have to learn, and it could be a prayer like, God, teach me to be content. Teach me to be content. And Paul, over time, as he's walked with God, and he's discovered what it means to be in the Lord, what it means to abide in Christ, what it means to walk with, I mean, as he's gone through that, he's also learned this thing called contentment. And I want to unpack this a little bit. The word content here means sufficient to self, not what you might think. Biblically, the definition here is sufficient to self. What it means is to be independent of external circumstances. To be independent of all people. To be independent from my wants or needs. Do you follow that? That's what it means to be sufficient, to be independent. In other words, my contentment is not contingent on external circumstances. It's not contingent on other people. It's not contingent on me getting my way. It's not contingent on money. It's not contingent on circumstances. None of that stuff. Warren Wiersbe said it like this. The word content actually means contained. It is a description of a person whose resources are within them. Here it comes. What have we been talking about? What did Paul the Apostle talk about Yodia and Sintichi about? Because you belong in the Lord. This idea of who's living inside of you. If you're living, if Jesus is living, here it is. If Jesus is living inside of you. If Jesus is living inside of you. You have nothing to worry about. Did you hear that? Did you pick that up? If Jesus is living inside of you, you have all you need. If Jesus is living inside of you, you are sufficient to yourself. It's not dependent on what he says or she says or they say or it or whatever. It's, it's all sufficient. It's all contained inside of you because Christ is living in you. You don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to have anxious thoughts. You don't have to have every question answered. You don't have to know the future because the one who's living inside of you sees everything. The one who's living inside of you is greater than the world. The one who's living inside of you knows the number of hairs on your head and he loves you and he watches over you. The one who's living inside of you is greater than anything you are facing. The one who's living inside of you has your future and he's watching over you. The one who's living inside of you is watching you and he loves you and he cares about you. You don't have to worry about anything. You can give every anxious thought to God because he's a good God and he has your future and he loves you. Greater is he who's in you than he's in the world. It's the game changer. That's contentment. It's Christ living in you. The one who sees all. The one who sees all. That's why Paul, he like trash talks here in verse 13. And he says something that's like a righteous arrogance. Let's just read it together, guys. He says this, I can do all things through him who's living inside him, who strengthens me. Such a popular verse out of Philippians chapter 4. I feel like it's in every, you know, locker room at some Christian school, you know, wherever they do squats or something like that, this verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I didn't grow up in a Christian school, so I don't know what it's like. But anyway, Paul is saying, hey, you know what? All you need is Jesus. Hey, you know what? You don't have to worry about anything. Hey, you know what? God sees everything. Hey, you know what? God is the judge. 
Hey, you know what? God sees the future. Hey, you know what? If you have Christ living inside of you, then you don't need anything else. That's what he's saying. All you need is Jesus. Now, here's a part for you to worry if Christ is not in you. If you've rejected Christ. Or check this out. Like he said earlier, it's possible to go to church and not be in the Lord. Right? You know how to talk. You know how to walk. You know what to say. You know how to joke. You know all that stuff. You know how to talk church. But you can go to church and not be in the Lord. I know we've all seen those people, right? We've all seen them. But Paul is saying, hey, check this out. There's this life of contentment, meaning all things are within you. It's Jesus living inside of you. Maybe some of you are at this place, spiritually, you have your own prison, spiritually. And you've been expecting your husband to make you happy, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your job. Who knows, people, church. You've been expecting other people to make you happy. Maybe your tagline is, I'm not happy. You know who you are. I want you to know it starts with the one in the mirror. And it starts with you humbling yourself. You got to humble yourself. And maybe you need to ask God for forgiveness. Maybe there's some sin in your life. But you got to let God start working inside of here. Let God change your heart. Say, God, change my heart. Change my mind. Do some construction, spiritual construction. I need new desires. I have fears inside of me that have a hold on me. I have, there's things inside of me that I know are not pleasing God. So I need you to do a work inside of me. Teach me what it means to be in the Lord. Teach me what it means to be in the Lord. And check this out. This is what contentment would look like. There could be a storm going on around you, but you're going to be just chill. The world could be falling apart. People are voting the wrong way, and this crazy stuff is happening, and there's layoffs happening, and there's things happening, and but you could just be chill. And you know why you're chill? Because of the one living inside of you. You're walking with him. And you hear his voice. And you know he's got your back. And you know he'll make all things right. And you're content, sufficient, containing everything within yourself. You came to church and some of you are in this place, this prison. And the first thing you need to do is turn to Jesus. You need to do that because it all starts with Jesus. Others of you, maybe you need to say, God, forgive me. I need you to stop expecting circumstances or others to make you happy. Come on now. You don't even know your own heart. Why are you expecting other people to know your heart? Come on. But God knows your heart, and God loves you, and God cares about you. Let him have his way in your heart. I want to pray for you. This is a part in the service. Um, as I pray... Would you just uh, let these words be your words? Would you make it your prayer? All right, make it your prayer. And if you're ready to ask Jesus into your heart, say this. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I want to become a Christian. You know, Lord, uh, I just haven't been walking with you at all. And it's been a mess but I need to ask you to give me new life. So I want you to get behind the steering wheel of my my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Take my future. Take my past. I choose to become a Christian right now. Others of you might need to say this. God, um, I want to learn what it means to be in the Lord. So Jesus, I ask you to uh, take over every, every corner of my heart, my life. <clears throat> Help me to stop being anxious. Help me to stop overthinking. And help me to just 
give those anxious thoughts to you and stop worrying about it. And I thank you, God. I thank you for your faithfulness over my life. I thank you, God, that you have my back all the time. Thank you. And some of you need to say this, God, teach me to be content. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. So as long as you're living inside of me, and I'm going to make an effort, and maybe you need to say this, God, I need a new craving to read your word every day. That desire is just not there. So I'm asking you, God, give me a craving to read your word, even if it's a little bit. I want to do it every morning, even if it's a little bit. Or you might need to say, God, change my heart right now. Make that your prayer. God, change my heart. Transform me. Help me to manage my thoughts. Help me to identify unhealthy, toxic, destructive thoughts. And I kick them out of my head right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your love, God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you for this church. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.